Happy Sabbath. We thank you, and also with us. Yes. Uh, this is uh, this is Mike, and and this is Jordan. Only one of us has the M div, so if you're going to pay attention to somebody's scriptural stuff, it'd probably be this guy. How, however, however, uh, there are natural talents that are given to all of us for knowing and understanding scripture, and. I love interacting with Jordan. I love interacting with so many of you because you have the opportunity to be inspired by the God who gives all of us inspiration. And uh, so we're, we're having a dialogue this morning. And, and we, we have chosen along the lines of our theme for this month, we have chosen to talk about another lesson from the Old Testament. And when I talked to Jordan about doing this originally. I said, this is what we're going to do, Jordan. Um, what do you think? And then we both went on vacation. <laughs> so uh, what happens today happens because of technology, and that is called a telephone. And so when you need to get together, you know that you can always get together on the telephone, which only goes to show that if you want to talk to somebody about Jesus, you don't have to necessarily be in their presence. You can also be on the telephone. Um, here's the point for today. First of all, just a, a recap. Last week, we talked, we didn't talk, but I talked to you about my own more, more recent testimony, and that God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for tomorrow. How many of you actually are going to say, I know this? Raise your hand. Okay, some of you are not convinced that God has a plan for you for tomorrow. So I just want to encourage you once again that based on my testimony last week, which you can look up on YouTube, basically for those who weren't here, uh, I was carjacked. Okay, and because of the way that God prepared, this was a rental, by the way, uh, in Atlanta, so not L.A., so we don't have to blame L.A. Okay, this is the East, you know. Because of how God prepared the way, I was in a Chevy Impala. And because I was in a Chevy Impala and not a Hyundai Elantra, nothing against the Hyundai, except it didn't have OnStar. Because, it had, because the Chevy had OnStar, and because God reminded me of that while I was in the police station, they called Enterprise, and Enterprise called OnStar, and OnStar shut the car down. Amen. And they found the car. And they answered the prayer that I prayed as I was being carjacked and what I told the sergeant who attended me, I will get all my stuff back, including this Bible that I have had since I was ordained. Do you know how much stuff is in here? Look at that. It's as something falls fall, out the bottom of it. <laughs> Maybe too much. <laughs> and my passport and all my identification. So I want you to know that they got the car back unscratched. They got all my stuff back, except for my cell phone, because the thief was smart enough to dismantle my cell phone and dispose of it so that it could not be tracked. I have a new cell phone because of insurance, so that was one of the learnings last week. If you don't have insurance on your cell phone, you should get insurance on your cell phone in case it's broken or stolen. In, the, in my case, stolen. But all this happened, and I got all my stuff back, and I made my next flight, which was at 6 o'clock that morning, albeit, albeit this happened at 12.30 at night. So I was taken at 4 o'clock or so to the airport by the police and dropped off there, and I made my next flight and rented again in Boston. And what do you think the car was that God gave me again? A Chevy Impala. It was the same color. It was a little newer, but it was the same color. So I want you to know that I was impressed with God at that moment that He will take care of you and that He has already made a way to take care of you. 
and that as we cooperate with him, that will be revealed to us as to how that is unfolded. I didn't know, oh, I better tell you, the Elantra got a flat. That's why I was in the Elantra. And I took it back to the airport and they gave me another car and the other car was the Impala. So you see what I'm saying? I didn't even choose that car. It was chosen for me. So God, God had a plan. He knew what was going to happen before I knew it. That was last week. This week, Jordan and I want to talk to you about the fact that God meets you wherever you are. Okay? He doesn't ask you to change. He doesn't ask you to be a different kind of person. He meets you right where you are. Um, we said to each other, Jordan, that God doesn't change. We do. Right. And uh, one of the things that we were sort of discussing, he told me his little tagline of God meeting us where you are, and I, I like sort of did that long-term Christian thing where you tune out because you've heard it so many times before, you don't really think about it in a new context. But um, <laughs> Pastors know you're doing that, though. <laughs> Just, just want you to know. I, I, I can see it in your eyes. Um, but then we were, we were talking about it in the context of the God of the Old Testament and the story of his right. people as it goes through. And that statement kind of took on a new turn for me because God meeting you where you are is not, uh, not necessarily always a rosy thing from our perspective. You know, sometimes he talks to you in the way that you need to be talked to, in the way that you are going to hear the most information from him. Um, I, I was thinking, there were, there were two things that I was just thinking about while I was waiting for the ferry and we were having our conversation, um, our, our in-depth planning session for this morning. Um, him coming back from vacation and me waiting for him to call. <laughs> if only we'd lined up at the same week, it wouldn't have been a problem. Um, <laughs> okay. But in, in high school, I had three different coaches through the entire time I was there. And two of them were pretty by the book, really nice guys, really encouraging. And I just wasn't really interested in doing a lot in PE when they were my coach, but in the middle year I had coach Brent Barishkin, and he was pretty much the guy who was yelling at you from the side while you're doing the mile, like throwing empty soda cans at you. And for some reason I really responded well in that year. And he would, <laughs> he would tell me to do stuff, and it wasn't, it wasn't like, I really would love it if you would do this for me, sports like, Thornburg, get out there, get moving! And it's like, oh yeah, sure, I'll do that. And so when I look at, you know, I'm, I'm projecting a fair bit of that Coach B vibe onto some of the God of the Old Testament stories, because these are people like us who needed a kick in the butt now and then, um, lovingly with with the with the end goal of a, uh, an investment in that person. But um, that was sort of something I was I was framing whether it's fair or not is entirely uh, up to everyone else. But we 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 sort of put this often against the Jesus figure that we know in the New Testament. And we accept that Jesus is God, and so we have this God of the New Testament, and we have this God of the Old Testament. And the God of the Old Testament is the kick in the behind God, and the God of the New Testament, oh, is so meek and mild, and, and you know, baby in the manger, and then he's, you know, he's, he's, making, he's making lunch for you, loaves and fishes, you know, he's, he's uh, oh, well, he's raising Lazarus, he's, he's, he's cool, he, he can raise you from the dead as well. It's not this this harsh uh, reality that seems to come across in, in the Old Testament. Well, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want that to come across as, as there's no love in, you know, God as he's portrayed in the Old Testament. I, I take a lot of comfort from uh, a lot of the stories in there because you can see a hand that's, that's wanting to be involved with us um, and, and wants to see what's best for us come to pass. We just saw the kids up front and... Um, uh, Jason, again, outstanding. Um, I, I love the fact that the, the, that the card stuck to the bottom of the glass. Did, did you, you physicists, you, you knew that would happen, right? That's, that's a, a, a adhesion, that's a physics thing that happened right there, and it was wonderful. And the, you could see the kid, I was close up here, so that I could see the kid's eyes go, <gasps> you know. God, God does that to us. He comes to us, and even if we're a child, in, 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 even if we have just a little bit of understanding or if we have a lot of understanding about him, 
or, or, or we are able to get what he says to us, God is willing to approach us where we are in our ability to understand him. Okay, he's going to make, as, as the old preachers would say, he's going to make it plain. He's, he's going to make it plain for us depending on where we are. Uh, yeah, and I, I really respect uh, when, when we look at the story of the, the Israelites moving through the Old Testament. This is the other thing that I didn't say over the phone, but I was thinking of the one piece of dating advice that my dad ever gave me. And that was to find somebody low maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to say that just a little louder? We've got a few uh, possible marriageable age people. Uh, but he said, he find said, somebody find what? Somebody low maintenance. Low maintenance. And I, I really oh, feel low like... Uh, main Did I, you hear that, ladies? Low maintenance. <laughs> okay, all right. And I feel like God really didn't take that advice. And, and I'm grateful he didn't because we are not a low maintenance uh, herd. And the Israelites, you know, were, were getting up to speed on a lot of things. And, and that was a high-maintenance relationship for God, I feel like. He had to... So what did he do first, by the way? How, if you're God and you need to reintroduce yourself after 430 years of slavery, Egypt, all that situation... Now you're out, you've got them out of Egypt. You've miraculously brought them out of Egypt. What was his first technique? This is a test for them, right? What was his first technique of getting them to understand who he was as we know him, as Seventh-day Adventists particularly are interested in portraying him? This is the first angel's message, by the way. Fear God and give glory to him. Which God? The God who made heaven and earth. So if you want to get that message across to people who've been in slavery for 430 years, but know you as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what is going to be your methodology? Shock and awe. Actually, deprivation and worms. You can get manna every day except Sabbath going to be none on Sabbath, deprived. If you save it on Wednesday for Thursday, it will have worms in it. I mean, is this basic or what? It, you know, it's using food as a teaching device for a people who have been your people. They are your people. They have been in bondage for 430 years and you're needing to teach them again that you are the God of creation. And what did he do on the seventh day, people? What did he do on the seventh day of creation? No, he created the Sabbath. So when we worship the God of creation on Sabbath, that's the connection. By you being here, by you saying, yes, the seventh day is the Sabbath, you are learning the lesson that God teaches you. What God, according to Revelation 14, 7? The God of creation, the God who made heaven and earth, the God who made Sabbath. He needed to teach his people this all over again. And he does it with food. He does it with, 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 with you, you could say jelly beans. He, he, he does it with, with manna. That is his way of meeting the people where they were in their ability to understand. They were hungry. They ran out of food. What do they need? They don't need a theological lesson at that moment. They need food. So he teaches them the theological lesson with food. It's one way that... He met the Israelites that way. Certainly a way I'd respond to even now. I mean, Certainly. Absolutely. We are watching the clock. We'll make sure you guys get your food so you don't feel... Yeah, don't watch that clock. Don't watch that clock. No. I put a battery in it and it doesn't work. <laughs> it's 1210, by the way. Okay? Um, another couple of, of examples, New, New Testament examples, are... Um, you mentioned the woman at the well, the centurion... Right. The Samaritan and the woman caught in adultery. Talk so what, about those different ones. What was interesting to me about putting all those side by side is um, Jesus displays a lot of that meeting you where you are kind of characteristic as well. 
because he doesn't talk to everybody in the same uniform way. No. Um, he tailors his message based on, on the person's background, on their social status, on their current situation. So you have him talking to a woman at the well mm -hmm. in, a, in a very different way than he'd be talking to you know, somebody who'd grown up in a different environment. The story, and I, I forget the actual scripture verse it comes from, but there's a lady who comes up to Jesus and asks for, I believe it's healing for her daughter, and, and he kind of says, well, like, why would I, why would I bless you kind of a thing, and, and her... Right, it's a, it's a Samaritan woman. Samaritan woman. Right. And uh, her answer back was, because he made some reference about, you know, a household dog or something, and she fires back with, well, well even, even a dog gets the scraps from the table. You're familiar with this story? I think it's a boy, and, 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 and the, the woman, the, the mom, the, the mom comes, and he's basically saying, uh, I'm, I, I'm actually here for these people over here, and you're not one of these people, and he's testing her. Right. He's not, I he's not being mean. It's, it's, I, I have to imagine there was kind of a half kind of grin at the corner of his mouth, and I think she was probably in on it too, mm -hmm. you know, in the sense that she understood the dynamic between her people and the people that he was saying he was there to talk to. So, you know, there's nuance in the way that Jesus talks to everyone. And, um, you know, the centurion, that's one of my favorite stories because the centurion, no, man, you got it. You just say that it's done and my guy will be healed. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's such a cool model for, for me on how to have my faith. But, you know, Jesus' way of talking to him is, yeah, I can do that for you. Are you sure? I can come with you. So there's, there's a different dynamic to, you know, the communication style that doesn't necessarily mean that the person is changing fundamentally from day to day. Um, and that's instructive for me to take back to God in the Old Testament because you can say, man, the, the lessons that he had to teach humanity and the way that he taught them <laughs> fluctuate from start to finish. And we go through the, the story from you know, Exodus up to Matthew, and it's, it's just a, it's a saga. Um, you mentioned Job. That's, it's one of, one of our personal favorites. Uh, we, we like the story of Job together. Do you remember the part when God speaks to Job and he says, Where were you, dude? <laughs> uh, and I actually read this monologue in Coach Barishkin's voice now, which is kind of weird. Um, but, you know, it's, it's this moment where God kind of does an, uh, a bit of grandstanding. I don't think it's for the sake of his own ego. No. Nope. It's, it's, you know... It's what Job needed to hear. He needed to be kind of recontextualized. Like, oh yeah, this is my place. That's your place. Do you, do you remember? Do you remember Job's response to that? I will shut my mouth because he had said, "Where were you when I created the Leviathan, the the whale, the the the, the alligator?" Uh, yeah, uh, I, I I wasn't there. I don't understand. So what I want you to grab here is the tendency that I think that we, we often have, and, and Jordan and I talked about this. We tend to want to make God so human that we can understand him. Oh yeah, God would do that. Or no, God would never do that. What I would like to put into your mind, maybe sow a seed, is... Maybe we should just let God be God. Okay, some of my friends who talk to me in theological terms, they don't want to let God be God. They want to say, no, God really couldn't do that, or no, God, well, why not? How come? This is what I want to know. So I want you to know that this pastor is very much possessed of the idea that God is a big God. He's bigger than me. And as the Veggie Tales taught us many years ago, he's bigger than the boogeyman. Boogeyman, right? Yeah, I do okay. know that. God is bigger. Yeah. So if we know that God is bigger, our picture of him that comes from the Old Testament that is, you know, in Job. <laughs> hey, were you there? No, you weren't. You weren't. I'm just going gonna, gonna to shut my mouth because I really don't have anything to say at this, at this point. And uh, to, to bring that back to what we'd been talking about before, I think that ties into you know, allowing God to meet you where you are and not trying to maybe take on part of his burden 
to join in that continuum, you know, you, there was a balance we talked about where you do feel compelled to um, change and do a little bit of the legwork to go meet God, but if you don't believe that he can come to you in the full sense, I think that's right. when you can see a lot of that behavior where you're trying to, you know, shoehorn him into some ideal and say, well, he'll probably be over there waiting for me. He'll probably be. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's a matter of what we had talked about, just trusting the infiniteness from a position of, of being finite. He, he tells us this in the second commandment. Tell me, tell me what the second commandment is. You shall not make any graven image. How about we push that just a little bit for you this morning because of what we're talking about here and say God is ready to meet you wherever you are and to make himself real to you. He would like it very much if you would not force him into a box. He would like it very much if you would not make him in your own image. Have you thought about that? That we potentially have made our own images in our mind about who God is and he would like very much for you to be open to the fact that he is so much more than that. New thought about the second commandment for you this morning, maybe. Yeah, I think, I think we need to let you go. I think we need to sing another song with Pete and the band. Um, we hope that you may be caught a little bit this morning from what we talked about, that there are lessons that we can learn from the Old Testament. This one is, what's the lesson today? God will meet you right where you are, and he'll make himself understood to you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.